three is down and safe. Out here in hangar B5 at Frederick Airport, and look who stopped by, 30-year British Airways pilot Mark Levy. Interesting background, he started flying when he was an air traffic controller in the British system at age 19. At that time, you had to get a pilot's license to be a controller. Loved flying, and from there went on and flew uh, commercially, and has been with British Airways now and flown 747s, 757s, 767s, pretty much sounds like about everything in the fleet. But interestingly, he's also a Warbird pilot. And so he was uh, just chatting with me about an incident he had recently in his P-51. So, Mark, thanks for stopping by the hangar. No problem. So do you mind sharing with us a little bit? You were talking about relatively new Warbird pilot flying one of your first P-51 sorties coming out of your checkout training. And then you have a pretty interesting incident happen. Yeah, I've, I've been flying air shows uh, since 1989. And uh, most recently in uh, Yak-50 airplanes, we have a small aerobatic team back in England. But like, like most pilots, we've always wanted to fly warbirds, and I got my shot this summer. Um, I, uh, on my own account, I went across to Florida and I did some flying with uh, Stallion 51, the well-known yeah. P-51 checkout experts. Sure. I did Lee Louderback's operation. That's down. right, yeah. and uh, they, they have an absolutely top-notch instructional uh, setup down there. I did uh, three trips, four hours, which is not the full checkout, but it gave me a really good appreciation of the airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, came back to England, and last summer uh, I was uh, asked by uh, an owner, would I like to fly his airplane? Well, that didn't take too long to say <laughs> yes to that. Um, I did another two or three hours to get uh, uh, some time on that airplane, and then I was asked to fly at the probably one of the biggest uh, warbird shows in the world at Duxford in England. It was a pretty big uh, formation you were in at the time, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's a two-day air show, and I had two slots to fly. I flew with a couple of other P-51s in the first slot of the day, which was a, a more dynamic uh, fly pass show. But the, uh, I think it's the same thing happens at Chino in California. The kind of the end, the signature piece is a large fly pass. We call it a Balbo after the Italian guy. There was 21 airplanes. We fly past in a great big formation for the crowd at the end of the show. And that had gone successfully on the Saturday of the show, all, all been well. It had been the first time I'd done it, and there were some challenges involved, but it had gone well. And then we were coming onto the second day, the first slot had gone well, we went onto the, the Balbo flight at the end. And we had done our first two passes, the back section of the formation had broken away, and all we had to do then was set up into our individual sections and do an overhead land, overhead and land, and that would be the end of the show. And, and I've ticked off my first Warbird Air Show. Okay, yeah, so here you're coming through on your last pass, literally your last pass to go into the overhead yep. and, uh, and do what we call the breakout and land. Yep. And so you were, uh, you were telling me you were, uh, you were in the middle of an echelon move, so which is, um, for the, for the sake of our audience, as you're in the turn and you're going to the breakout, the lead has moved you to the other side of the formation. That's right, yep. So you're moving from the left side, you're in this move to the right side of the formation in the number three position, and then... Well, obviously there's a certain amount of uh, throttle movement to stabilize in the formation, and as I was pulling up next to the number two airplane, the engine quit. Hmm. Maybe two, three seconds? Yeah. And then it started again, and there's just that instantaneous startle moment when you just go what and and the brain just goes uh, and it's but it, the fact that it started again you go into an instant denial well, it must have been some water in the gas or yeah. uh, or something in retrospect this is a merlin engine it's gulping 40 gallons an hour even at low power settings it's not going to be water in the fuel but you just you go into denial yeah and you want to believe everything's okay yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and so 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 i think well, well it must have been something so i started to move back up again move the throttle again, it quit again, but this time for a lot longer. And I realized pretty much at that point, hey, you're gonna have to deal with this. Okay, and so relative position now, you're, you're basically on the downwind, but you guys had extended through the show, so you're, you're sort of on the departure into the runway or maybe even not quite yeah, there. Yeah, we, we, we were turning from crosswind to downwind, so yeah. we're maybe two or three miles away from the airfield. Yeah. But the critical thing with an airplane of this size and this energy, there was no energy. Yeah. I mean, the airplane, we, we were, the, the, the brief fly past speed was 190 miles an hour. We were maybe at 1,000 feet as we turned downwind, so I've got no energy. Okay. So when that engine quits, this is a 7,000 pound airplane, it, there's, you know, there's, there's just no energy. To, I traded a little bit of speed for height, maybe gain a couple of hundred feet. So I'm starting my engine out from say 11, 1200 feet and 190 miles an hour. Airplane best glide is 150 miles an hour, so oh, okay. it doesn't take much to work out. There's not a lot of energy there. Yeah, you're not getting a lot of altitude there. No. So after the second time, 
so the sort of uh, realization that you've got an issue takes over and now you start yep. trading airspeed for altitude, yep. essentially. And, and, and to a certain extent, you know, I was a CFI, I've, sp I've taught a lot of students about engine failures and a certain amount of that uh, learnt uh, behavior starts to happen. So I, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, let's go, what's best glide sleep? Let's get the aircraft back to its best glide speed. Configuration, the air flaps are up and then start to look for your field. Now, fortunately in that part of England, it was mid-July, there's plenty of big cornfields out there. Most of them are around about 1,600 feet long and some 2,000 feet long. So plenty to put a P-51 in and I had, a, I had an absolutely richness of choice so I could pick one. And the first one, I set the airplane up. The engine was at this point not running. So I'm now kind of regressing to um, patterns of behavior which I've been ingrained over, over years. Yeah. So I'm getting the airplane at the right speed. I crank the canopy open because obviously I don't want the canopy shutting me if I'm going to put the airplane down. And I'm thinking, okay, this is not my best day. And then the engine starts again. Mm. Okay. And this is the problem. This is not an engine failure. This is a intermittent partial engine failure. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, we talked about this. This is probably much more dangerous than a straight engine quitting. Yeah, that, I, I, you and I were chatting about that earlier. How much ch more challenging that is because your mind goes back and forth between I can make it, I can't make it. I mean, an engine out, best uh, field scenario to know I can make the airport scenario. Yep. And flipping that back and forth is much more challenging than having to face one situation or the other. And as, as, it's, as it's proven from the video is that every time the engine quit, I was so near the ground, I had to make decisions looking out the cockpit. So I had very little time to actually do fault finding within the cockpit. In fact, when, the only time I was able to do fault finding was when the engine was running again and I was mm. gaining a little bit of height and I'd look inside and because the engine's running, yep. it's not showing me any of the symptoms as to why the engine has failed. Right, okay. Engine then stops, I could look out again. So it's, it's really tricky. Yeah, back and forth. Now, at what point you had the first engine failure then the kind of disbelief, it comes back, then the second engine failure. At what point did you, did you make a mayday call? Did you notify your flight lead? How'd you handle the, the whole comms part of that? Um, well, you can see on the video, I, I, I pressed the, uh, the radio button, which is one on the throttle, after the second engine failure. I can't remember exactly, because the tape doesn't pick up the sound, but I think I put out a pan call or a mayday call, said I've got an engine failure, I might be landing out. But at that point, you know, the, one, the first thing that goes is hearing, so if anybody replied to that or anybody said anything, I was task saturated at that yeah. point, and the hearing's the first thing to go. So the next thing I heard was actually when we were much nearer to the airfield. That's a really critical point you made that, that we should be reminded of. When you get task saturated, one of the first things that goes is your ability to process new information. Correct. Such as your hearing and Correct. so forth. So, yeah, interesting. All the sounds may be there, people may be telling you stuff, but you're focused on some tasks and you're completely saturated and you won't hear any of that stuff oftentimes. Interesting point. Which became a problem later on, as we'll, as we'll get to. So uh, so now you're, you're set up on basically the perch, right? Where you're kind of a beam, your you're touchdown point, but you're 180 out, and your engine's in and out running. Is, it, is that right? And now uh, what happens from here? Well, as, as the video shows, I had another couple of engine failures at that point, but each time the engine failed, I could see I'd got pretty good selection of fields to go into. But my kind of natural animal instinct had taken me back towards the airfield. Uh, and I then saw the airfield appearing out my left-hand side. I'm thinking, hey, I've got, a, I've got a chance here. I was maybe at four or 500 feet, 150 miles an hour, the engine running kind of intermittently. And I've got maybe, I've got to go sort of down the second half of the downwind leg. I've got to turn base, base to final. But I'm thinking, hey, I might be able to make this. And then I made another mistake. Hmm. At that point, the tower, I could see I, they'd heard my call. I was kind of approaching base leg and they're starting to shout at me, your gear's not down, your gear's not down. There's my task saturation going on again. Someone gives you an instruction and the chimpanzee at the back of the head says, hey, I can do that. Yeah. I can do that. So I put the gear down. Yeah. At which point the engine started to run down again. So mm. I've now got drag. Mm. Uh, I've, got a, I've got 180 degrees of turn to go and that was a dumb thing to do. But I'm, the engine's still intermittently running. At this right. point, I'm thinking, eh, maybe. Yeah, right. Bearing in mind, I've now got a, a freeway between me and the airfield. Mm. Mm. So, um, so you, you, you put the uh, gear down and the engine now quits again. So now you got the added drag and you got the engine that's quit. You're, you're basically on a base turn, right? Absolutely. You're, you're on a base turn runway. A tight, tight base turn. And previously you thought you could probably make it with the engine running. Because when the engine would come back, you would have full power, right? It wasn't as if you'd have intermittent power? Uh, I, I, had, I had some power. It, it, it clearly wasn't a lot of power, okay. otherwise it would climb. So yeah. I was still just about maintaining four to 500 feet, 150 miles an hour throughout these engine failures with a, probably a, a slow loss of height. Yeah, okay, and then, uh, so what happens from there? Well, I'm 
say th about halfway around the base turn, I can see the final approach. I've got a little bit of flap down, it's still running, and then the engine quit again. And this time it, it quit for a long time. The airplane starts to sink. I'm looking at the airfield, it's just cl it's so close I could touch it. I'm just gonna get over that freeway, just get the airfield. But the key thing, there are two key things for me happened at this point, Richard, was I start to see the horizon moving up the windshield. Now that, to any pilot who's learned how to fly, that's the cue that you're starting to sink. Yeah. And that's the point where you'd normally put power on. Right, yeah. I don't have any power. Yeah. The second thing is, I don't have a lot of time in the airplane, but I've, I've flown the airplane enough to know its characteristics, and the airplane talks to you. It talks with the gun ports. The, the gun ports whistle on a P-51 as the angle of attack increases. And at mm. that point, I've got the horizon moving up the windshield, the gun ports starting to whistle, this airplane is about to stop flying. You, see, you were telling me that those gun ports really only whistle at two different uh, occasions. One, when you're at the start of a loop, yep. I think, right? When yep. you get uh, a pretty high airspeed and you go into a loop. Yep. And the second one was high angle of attack right before you touch down normally. Yep, it's, it, they, they start to whistle and the whistle gets more, uh, sort of higher as you get to the touchdown angle of attack. Which is a real cue to you that you're losing airspeed and getting close to critical angle of attack and yep. stall, right? Yep. So, Amidst all of that, you pick that up in the base turn with this with this decreasing airspeed and this added bank that you're beginning to hear this high AOA sound that this airplane yep. is telling you. That's right. Well, which 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 any pilot, if they know the airplane well, those kind of characteristics, pitch attitude, that kind of thing, it's the kind of thing to get ingrained that'll t that'll talk to you before the airspeed indicator will tell you that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, before that that makes the point of knowing your knowing your airplane. Know your airplane, I mean, and even you didn't have that much experience in the Mustang, but you knew those critical Enough. signs, right? Enough. And, I mean, that, that, was a, that, that was huge that yeah. you recognized that. Yeah. So now what? You, you're thinking, I can make the airfield, I can't make the airfield, I'm starting to hear this whistling sound. I, I put the gear down, wish I hadn't, but you sucked it back up at that point or is the gear still down? Well, at this, at this point, it really is instinct and experience. I can't make the field. I've got no choices at all. The only choice I've got is the one that's in the undershoot. So I turned away from the airfield. Clearly it's going to be an off airport air landing and that's drummed into me and these big warbirds, three, three point airplanes, you've got to pull the gear up. Because if that airplane tips up on its nose, it's going to be on its back. And if you're going to be able to get out, that's going to be debatable. Right, yeah. So instinct, pull the gear up, dump the remaining flap, roll the wings level and continue to fly. This is the key thing, Richard. If anybody reads uh, Bob Hoover's book, he always yeah. says, Fly the airplane as far into the crash as you can, and right, that's yeah. kind of in the back of my head. So keep the airplane controllable. If you can keep the airplane controllable to touchdown, you're in a better situation than if you lose control of the airplane someplace in the sky. Mm -hmm. If you get a wing drop or a spin, that's all out of your control. So fly the airplane down to touchdown, which is what I did. Yeah, and that was a critical point, right, for you to realize, I want to make the runway, but wishing is not a strategy, right? You're just not yep. going to make the runway, so you give that up make the recognition that you're gonna be in a field here. At that point, you said instincts. So talk to us a little, a little bit about where do those instincts come from? I mean, you only had four or five hours, maybe six, maybe 10 in the Mustang at this point, six or seven sorties. How is that an instinctual thing? Where did that come from? Well, I guess from, from flying GA from when I was 19 years old, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't have had those instincts as a low out pilot, but each hour you put on, Provided you do the training, the thing to do is you've got to do these things. I mean, even when I was flying my own airplane, the Yak-50, doing air displays, I mean, I knew the airplane's uh, envelope pretty well, but I always made sure that every month I'd go up and do a spin, I'd do, a, I'd do a, an engine off landing, so I could remind myself of the glide characteristics of the airplane. Those are the things that you put into your central cortex and they are there to be retrieved when you need to do so. Okay, so it wasn't an airplane I was very familiar with, but they're just instincts you build up over time, provided you, you reinforce those instincts by yeah. doing the training. It's all very well doing the $100 Hamburg and flying point A to point B, but you've got to train yourself to do the difficult stuff and do it regularly enough that it becomes an ingrained procedure and you can call upon it when you need it. Yeah, and so what's also interesting, I think instructive to the rest of it is, is I haven't watched your video and when, when the people see the video, they can see down in your cockpit and see where you're looking and see some of your hand movements. At nowhere in there do you have time to pull out a checklist. This is all memory item stuff, right? There are some things in an airplane, any airplane, even a Super Cub behind us, yep. where you, there's no time to get a checklist. There are a few stages of flight where you got to know what your reaction is going to be. How yeah. did, talk to us about that. Yeah, checklists. I mean, checklists are essential. When, you, when, you, when you're starting your flying career, 
and I mean, I mean obviously I fly 747s. Right, yeah. Checklists are intrinsic to the way we operate the airplane as a team. It's a very complex airplane. But I think, I think if you're flying small GA airplanes, if you're familiar with the airplane, you fly regularly, uh, all these airplanes I fly, I have a basic left to right check. Mm -hmm. That's my cockpit check. So, so is me, I, I go left to I right. I go left yeah. to right, I have my uh, mnemonics. Gump will do for most airplanes. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got something a bit more complex because the airplanes I fly are a bit more complex. But I do them every time I fly, I run through them each time. And the more you do it, the more it becomes instinctual. Yeah. Uh, I believe checklists have a place, but certainly on the airplanes I fly, often there's nowhere to put it. I mean, yeah. th these airplanes don't have glove boxes or, yeah. or nice little wallets you can stick stuff down in. Right, so, yeah. And military flights, I, I, I mean, you're an ex-military guy yourself. Right. Most of it is scan, is scan flow checklist yep. and, not, and memorized checklist. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, in my military training, most airplanes I flew, there was a set of what they called bold-faced items where critical phases of flight, you had to Those memorize. Those are memorized items, yeah. right. And, you know, they would get a little overboard with them. You had to have every commonplace, every period, right? And they were trying to make a point that you must know this checklist exactly. Yep. And there must be no question in your mind if these things happen, these steps you go through. Yep. But you and I were talking about that. You had some interesting uh, observations about your airline training and how um, when things happen, you have a certain amount of reaction time. You called it a monkey, I think, and you got to put the monkey back in the cage. Yep. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, obviously the airlines over the last 30 years have spent a lot of money uh, and done a lot of research about how the human being interacts with machinery and how we as basically with the still the prehistoric model of uh, the way our brains work, but we're operating modern machinery and that prehistoric model comes to the fore when you're under stress. So we call it the, we call it the chimpanzee mode. You're going back to something from the stone age, the fight or flight mode. And that's designed to put all kinds of chemicals into your bloodstream and run away from a saber-toothed tiger or a mammoth, which is great if the complexity of the problem is simply turning around and running away. But if you've got a complex problem in front of you, that actually gets in the way. You get this blind panic comes on and you want to do something. You want to do something, anything, because that's what your prehistoric man is telling you. Now with these airplanes, airliners, military airplanes, you need to have an instinct which draws you back from that. Take a breath. The startle factor can actually make you do something dumb quickly. What you want to do is can the startle factor, put the chimpanzee back in the box, give yourself time to think, and then your more modern instincts will come to the fore and you'll start to do something sensible. Yeah. And what we're trained is that a good way of caging the chimp, as you call it, is to come up to with some one of those uh, learnt ingrained patterns which tells you to do something. So if you, if you have a, a scan check we do with an engine failure, right, okay, the engine's failed, access that little uh, piece of data and go, right, so I'm going to need to change the tanks over, go put the boost pump on, make sure the mixture's rich, the mags are on both. And that action of doing something which is ingrained in your memory will start to cage the chimp and bring you back to the kind of the modern guy, which will actually work the problem in a logical fashion. Yeah, that's such interesting stuff. You and I were chatting in my military training when I flew the F-15. They taught us the same thing, and, and uh, I don't think it was quite as well refined, but in essence, they had a three second uh, reaction time built into any takeoff problem that you had. And so what they would try to instill in us is take three seconds and make the optimum decision, not one second and have a reactive decision. Yeah, it's, it's, it's two sides of the same, same viewpoint. Yeah, yeah. And, and the whole, uh, now that I think about it in your terms, I think what they were trying to get us away from is that, and you don't, you don't you think only three seconds, but I think three seconds a lifetime. Critical, is a long time. Yeah. You can do a lot of bad things in three seconds. Oh, sure. So um, taking, that, taking that time to process it like you're talking about and then move into the, move into the reaction that you've so ingrained in your mind, yeah. right, to put the chimpanzee back in the, back in the cage, that, that's really good instruction. So there you are, you've, you've, you've cranked up the gear, or you've raised the gear. You said you raised your flaps a little bit. No, no, I, I dumped the flaps all the way you down. You dumped it all I, the way, I, well, okay. yeah, just, just to slow the touchdown, yeah, obviously, we're talking about energy here. You've got yeah. to dissipate energy. So if you can get your flaps all the way down, touch down at the lowest possible speed without losing control of the airplane, that's energy dissipated and that's going to be in your favor. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about you make the decision to pull the gear up. And you said just a few minutes ago that's pretty critical in, in some of the warbirds you fly because your danger is really flipping. Sure. Right? In an off-airfield la off airfield landing, I've had that conversation a lot with different people. I fly a Navy on a lot. And my, uh, my, I've always had the same position that if I had to go off airfield in a rough field, 
or even if I thought it was rough, I'm going to take my chances, gear up rather than the gear down. Sure. For that same for that same reason. Do you think that trans transfers beyond the warbirds that you fly? What about if you're flying a Mooney? Uh, I know you've flown a lot of different GA airplanes in your background. What's your sure. thinking? Gear up or gear down? Uh, I think I think gear up. I mean, the the thing you've got to remember is, and it, and it's probably more difficult for an owner pilot is that that airplane has let you down. You, yeah. You've got to move on to the point where this airplane, you may have had this airplane for 30 years, you polish it every Sunday, that's your baby. Once that engine has failed, the airplane has let you down and that airplane is now a, uh, it's a, a capsule for dissipating energy. It's to, it's to save your life. Use the airplane the best way to do that. Now obviously if you've got a Mooney, you want to maybe think, oh if I put the gear down, we could, we could say this, I won't trash the prop and I won't trash the can because I know how much the, uh, you know, a cowling costs. That airplane is your survival capsule and use it for such. So if you're going to put it in a field, you want the airplane to slow down as quickly as possible. You don't want to run through the end. Yeah, put the gear up. Airplanes can be fixed, people can't. Yeah. Interesting concept there, Mark, you, that mental transition from saving my airplane to saving my life and using the airplane as a vehicle to do that and dissipating that energy over as long a period as you can. Yep. So even that is going through your mind in this uh, pretty pretty short time span that you got because you were a couple hundred feet when you finally decide this thing's not gonna make it, right? And you're just watching your video from the point that happens. I don't know, it felt like you had 10 seconds and, and you were in the field. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat disappointed that I didn't do certain things that I always made sure my students practiced when we did practice engine failures uh, and you know, I, I'm, I'm very open about it. I didn't do a lot of things right, uh, but that's the one thing I did do right, was turning away. But having turned away, like you said, at maybe 150 feet, I had very little time to do anything. So for me, the priority was to get the gear traveling up and get the flap down. Um, the one thing I didn't do, which I should have done, was turn the magnetos off. Because mm, you yeah. consider, I've now, instead of having made a decision way back when to just put an aircraft into a field somewhere downwind, which is a tough decision to make when the engine starts and stops. And this yeah. is why a, a partial failure is much more dangerous than, a, than a, an actual complete failure. At that point, I was committed. I was down at sort of 20 feet. I had the, had the gear traveling up. It was going to be an off airport landing. If the engine had picked up at that point, that wouldn't have been great. So I really should have had the magnetos off and I was disappointed I hadn't done that. But like you said, I had maybe 10 seconds to make yeah. a decision and, mm, yeah. and you, you, can Monday, you can Monday morning quarterback <laughs> this any, much, uh, any way you like, but it, 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 it turned out okay. Yeah, which is why I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about the lessons learned so that if any of us get in that situation, hopefully some of these things will come back to our mind. But we were talking earlier about, you know, airplanes can be fixed. Your airplane went in, you, you hit a concrete pillar with your wing, it turns it sideways, so it basically shears at least part of the wing off. Your gear up, the props all dented, people will be able to see in the video. And yet you were telling me that it's gonna be back flying for this year's air show. This yeah, air well, show, right? I mean, uh, it's because I put the aircraft into a field just away from the air show site. You know, I was joined by the aircraft owner, the aircraft owner's insurance broker, Steve Hinton, the guy that ran the air show. And they were all around and, and discussing stuff. And the owner was, was fantastic, he just said, look, don't worry, you're fine. The airplane can be fixed, and the airplane is being fixed. We, we chipped it out to, uh, to the States uh, about a month after the accident. Uh, a new wing has been built, uh, the fuselage has been checked over, the engine's away getting stripped down and that'll come back. And the airplane should be flying sometime in the next month, so fingers crossed if all goes well, I should be flying the same airplane at the same show yeah. a year later. Yeah, hopefully with a better result. Hopefully where your takeoffs and landings equal. Correct. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's see, so you're, you're in the field, we pick it up again, uh, the airplanes come to a stop. You were telling us that as you hit the field, the, the crops were a little bit higher than what you could see. So there was a concrete post there that, yep. that you actually slid into with your right wing, right, which kind of... Yeah, they, they, they kind of turned two fields into one, but when the farmer did that, he sowed the crops, but he didn't take out one of these old concrete posts, which actually dates back from the 1930s when they built the airfield, because the airfield originally was, actually took part of that, that field was part of the airfield before mm -hmm. they put the freeway in. Um, so that was just there, the, the farm presumably knew around that he used to plow around it, but I didn't see it, I didn't have much choice. Yeah. But it hit about six feet in from the right wing tip, so I got a kind of hard yaw as I touched down. Yeah. And that's really the only injury I got. I got a kind of bit of a stiff neck for the next couple of days after that, just yeah. from the yaw touchdown. But um, although the video shows it's being quite violent, the deceleration was quite strong. It wasn't actually that bad. Yeah. And you had cranked the uh, canopy back, so I fly a Navy on it, has a sliding canopy. And we have similar issues in that in frequently in off airport landings, the canopy will, uh, will bind. 
And if you haven't kicked, you know, pulled it back, you'll be trapped inside the airplane. And several Navion owners have. So that was that was something that you did pretty quickly. Was I noticed? In yeah, the video, it's, pretty it, quickly you cranked the, the canopy. I, I cranked the canopy, open, but that, again, that's reverting to a previous type. Uh, the previous types I had, you couldn't you couldn't actually jettison the canopy. So the option was open the canopy. The actual uh, military manual for the P-51 says in an off-airport landing, jettison the canopy. Hmm. So I didn't do that. So again, it's something in. I could question, was it the correct thing to do? Um, the trouble was, at the point where I was definitely committed to off-airport landing, I was over the freeway. So right. if I had jettisoned the canopy, 300 pounds of perspex would have landed on somebody's head. So maybe it was probably just as well I didn't. Yeah, and you and I chatted about that. We're not making your emergency somebody else's emergency. Ideally. Is, is, is definitely something that goes through your Ideally. mind. You don't want to do that. So you've landed, you've come to a stop. I think we, we uh, you mentioned that it took about 100 feet from the time you hit until it dissipates all its energy. That's standing. That's all you needed. It's it, standing. If, you, if you've got so much friction in the belly of the airplane, all that crop, I mean, the airplane stopped very, very quickly. And it, it has actually modified what I'm going to look for next time I'm flying in any, any airplane, it, the airplane stopped pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, and certainly if, in the case of a retractable airplane with the gear up, it gives you a lot more options of fields. I mean, I taught all my students, you want, you know, you want at least 1,000, 1,200 feet of, of pasture to land in, in a Cherokee or a Cessna, because it's going to roll because it's got fixed gear and all yeah. the rest of the stuff. But if you're flying a retractable airplane and you keep the gear up, you're looking for a really small field. Hmm. As long as you get over that boundary fence, yeah. get it down, it will stop, believe me. Yeah. Hmm. So you're sitting there and uh, it comes to rest. There's no fire. You made it. Uh, I think in your video, you make an immediate call that let your flight members know three's okay. Three's down and safe. It was a nice thought. Unfortunately, the antenna's under the wing and that was snapped off somewhere back in the wreckage <laughs> okay, trail. Yeah. So they didn't hear it. Yeah, but, okay. you know, I'm, I'm thinking of my buddies. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was a good, it was a good thing to think about. And, uh, and now you just get out and, and uh, egress and wait for, the, uh, wait for the folks to arrive. At that point, your adrenaline starts to draw down yeah. a little bit and you say, holy smokes, I, I made uh, it. Holy smokes, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and inevitably think, I've just broken this beautiful airplane. What are they going <laughs> to say? But... And from the, I think we were looking at it, and from the everything's going great, 104 seconds later, you're in a field with the gear up and your P-51 going, wow, that was yep. a quick 104 seconds. 104 seconds, and that's, that's the time I had to deal with it. Yeah. It would have been shorter if it had been a complete engine failure, but as I said, the complexity is probably doubled or tripled because you've got the thing coming and going, coming and going. And, and your thought processes, which start in one direction, have to then go through 180 degrees, go back in another direction. You do that three or four times, your work level is really high. Yeah. But the important things are fly the airplane, keep the airplane in the air, keep the speed good, and keep your options open and as much as you can try and go back on those thought processes which you, you've ingrained in your own head to check for the for the problems and give yourself a good plan good options yeah and so we were talking about there was an engine problem we can see in the video you're switching tanks it wasn't a fuel trapped or a fuel issue or anything it seems like it was some sort of problem with the engine perhaps the carburetor but that's still yet to be yet to be determined yeah that's right yeah, so it's they, certainly yeah. if you look at the video i've got fuel pressure problems um, which would suggest that it's somewhere between the tank and the engine, but I'm told by the experts, and I don't count myself as an expert, that carburetor problems can manifest themselves in other ways. Um, it's, it's unknown at the moment. Yeah. Mm. Well, you wrote a great article, uh, Mark, that you shared with me on it, and in that you sort of summarized the things that you were happy with of how you did and the things that you would do differently. And the first thing is, I just appreciated that that's the way you think, that you come out of this thing and, and you were able to save yourself and cause no damage to any other people, the airplane will be fixed. And yet, just talking through you, I can still three, see you thinking through the next time this happens, this is what I would do differently, which to me is such an important piece of our culture in aviation. That's how we get safer and safer. Is we're not sure. afraid to put it on the table and say, these were the facts, this is what I would do differently if I could do it again. Do you mind summarizing that with us? What, what were you happy with that you thought went well? What would, be, what would you do different? Um, there's, there's a couple of things. Uh, clearly, when the, the engine failed the first time, you can see on the video, it's only for a very short period of time. And somehow I rationalized that as being water in the fuel or a, a bug or something. It's the natural denial yeah. that, that, that it's, this is a problem. I mean, I'm in an airplane. I, I'm in an air show at Duxford flying a Mustang. This is the best day of my life. It can't happen to me now. I, it cannot be happening to me now. And that denial, probably it probably cost me another 100 feet. If I'd pulled out of the formation at that point, maybe another 100 feet, maybe that would have got me back on the ground. 
So if you get an engine, if you get an engine problem, deal with it. Don't ignore it. Mm. It's part of the startle factor, but it's something yeah. I was a bit disappointed at. After that, yeah, most of it went pretty well. Um, again, the canopy, should I have re jettisoned the canopy at that point when I was committed to off airport landing? When I was out over open fields, yeah, maybe I should have done that. But I didn't, but it's, it's, that's what the manual says. Yeah. And the manual has been written by people who, uh, generally it was written in blood. So that's what the manual says, that's what, the manu that's what you should do. But I regret, I kind of reverted to a previous type because I wasn't that experienced on the airplane. Yeah. Um, thirdly, downwind, someone shouts at you, put your gear down. They have no idea what's going in the cockpit, wh wh what level of emergency you've got. They're only trying to be helpful, yeah. but remember, you know, ATC will be as helpful as you can, but you're the guy that's flying the airplane. Yeah. So assess what they're giving you, use it if you can, but if it's not, if it's not relevant, don't let it overwhelm what you're doing. Um, finally, that turn, the best thing I did was turn away from the airfield. Like you said, you could have prayed and, and tried to stretch that glide, but then you would not be in control. If you're on the edge of the envelope of the airplane, that's when you, you, you've got no margin for error. By turning away from the airfield, I could keep control of the airplane and choose where I put the airplane down, not let the airplane choose. Yeah. On, the, on the negative side, yes, I should have had the magneto shut off in an ideal world, but I was kind of busy at that time. Yeah, and plus you're going back, we go back to the complexity of the engines running, not running, running, not running. I'm yeah. convinced, you know, if it, if it just completely shut off, you would have gone through all that stuff. What a story! We're glad you're we're glad you're back safe, and thanks for sharing it with us. It's been I hope it's, it's been useful to other pilots of any type. Yeah, really thankful for you to stop by and share your experience my, my and your lessons learned and helping GA safety. Uh, thanks to folks like you, we just keep getting safer and safer in general aviation. So thanks that's for sharing the, your experience. That's the way it should be. Great. All right. Thanks for joining us in the hangar.